Okay, today is December 6, 2002, and this is the beginning of an interview with uh, Mr. Frederick Wright Arnold at Erlanger Health Link Plus office at 975 West 3rd Street in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Mr. Arnold was born on April 20th, 1918, and is now 84 years old. My name is Tony Mavrides, and I will conduct this interview. Uh, Mr. Arnold, if you would, for the recording, please state your name and your full name and how it's spelled. My full name is Frederick Wright Arnold, F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C-K, W-R-I-G-H-T, A-R-N-O-L-D. Wonderful. In which branch of service did you serve? Served in three. Okay. Served in uh, uh, the Air Force, Air Corps back then. Okay. As a weather forecaster. Not a sergeant, a weather forecaster with the, I can't remember, the fourth uh, weather region. Okay. And uh, from there, I went to Chanute Field, Illinois, to get some more training about weather. Okay. Now, which, just, to, just at this point, just give me an idea of which different branches you serve. Uh -huh. So you're so there, obviously the Army. Okay. And which other, you said that you served in three branches? Yes, sir. Okay. That's Air Force, number one. Army? And Army. And what else? Uh, uh, Anti-aircraft was the middle one. Okay. I got my commission in uh, at Camp Davis, North Carolina. Okay. And uh, served with uh, the, the anti-aircraft artillery okay. for a couple of years. Okay. And from there... I went out one day and saw a bunch of officers uh, policing up cigarette butts, so I asked for the infantry. I was then sent to the infantry school at Fort Benning, Georgia. Okay. Got uh, training, retreading there okay. in, in the infantry uh, works or training. And uh, from there, uh, I was assigned to uh, Pacific Ocean Area Command, okay. and my friend that ha had gone through school with me and I, John Schofield, uh, flew from Memphis, Tennessee to Okinawa with several stop-offs okay. at POAC Command uh, and got our orders to uh, report to the 305th Infantry, and uh, uh, that was a regiment which was in the 77th Infantry Division. Okay. Now, jump ahead a little bit for me. Now, tell me, I know you finished up there. We're going to come back and talk about this, okay? Mm -hmm. But tell me, when you finished up in active duty, you joined the Reserves, and at what rank did you, uh, were you when you finished in the Reserves? When I finished with the Reserves, I was a Lieutenant Colonel. Wonderful. Now, which, uh, obviously, you've hit on this a little bit, but uh, what theater did you spend most of your service in while you're in active duty? Which part of the world? Uh, Pacific Ocean area. Okay. Okinawa the, went back to a rest camp in uh, Cebu Island in the Philippines and stayed there until they dropped the bomb. Okay. They dropped the bomb while I or announced it while I was sitting in a movie theater on a bench out in the woods with a bunch of people and we were waiting for the uh, get dark enough to show, show the movie and there were Japanese sitting around in the edge of the woods watching our movie, Good which didn't bother us at all. Okay. We took uh, 7,000 Japanese uh, prisoners off of uh, Cebu Island. Okay. Hold that thought, okay? Okay, Mr. Arnold, tell me about uh, maybe where you were born and, and about your family, um, you know, parents and things of that sort, maybe other brothers and sisters. Just tell me, uh, take a few minutes here and tell me where you were born. I was born in Chattanooga, in uh, the Brainerd area. Okay. And uh, moved to, uh, during the Depression, we moved to the Highland Park, where I went to school, and uh, graduated at uh, uh, Central High School was in the military band, and uh, then uh, we moved to uh, Lookout Mountain, where I took an examination for the post office, and uh, was appointed by 
uh, Jim Farley, Postmaster General then, as a regular rural letter carrier on Lookout Mountain. And uh, at one moment, or some moment of time, I was the, the youngest regular rural letter carrier in the United States. Wow. But now I don't know how long that lasted, but okay. they told me that one time. Now did you have brothers and sisters? or? Yes, I had uh, three brothers. Okay. And uh, no, no sisters. Had, uh, had two brothers. That made three of us, three boys. And uh, they uh, uh, grew up and married and, uh, and uh, had children. And I waited until after the war. Okay. I knew it was coming. And to, to marry a little girl that I was kept in after school for courting in the third grade at Ridgedale Grammar School. Mm. And we're, we're still married, we're still going. We've slowed down a little bit, but we're still going. Okay. I have one grandchild, Lee Arnold, who's named after me. His name is Frederick Lee Arnold. And we're real proud of him. He's six years old now. And uh, we do things together, hunt rocks and collect rocks and things like that. I lost one of my brothers who was a veteran. He was uh, in engineers, Army engineers. And another brother was at uh, Aberdeen Proving Ground where he... Uh, did time or did service in uh, Canada. Okay. And uh, from there, uh, as a rural letter carrier, I was there four and a half years. And uh, now let's stop right there one second. Let's go back and pick up a couple things. Now, you mentioned you had a, a grandson that was mm -hmm. named after you, but you skipped something in there. In order to have a grandson, you must have had other, you had children yourself. Yes, I had children. I had okay. had uh, two boys. Okay. Uh, Timothy and Peter is the one who's fathered the the uh, grandson. Okay. And Wendy is my daughter, still helping take care of me at home now. Wonderful. Now, now let's jump back to uh, there where you're a, a letter carrier. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, about what year was this? That was in 30, graduated high school 36, that's about 38. Okay. I can't remember the That's okay, you're doing date. great. Uh, this is about 38. Uh, how long were you uh, doing your rural route there on, on the mountain and things? Uh, that was uh, four and a half years. Okay. And what happened four and a half years in that made you change? Uh, friends of mine were were in the uh, European theater, and I lost several of them. A couple of them by air, and a couple of them as prisoners of war. And I just felt it was coming on the December seventh, nineteen forty-one. Uh, was Pearl Harbor, and I lived through that. So that caused me to write a letter, or prompted me to write a letter to the Postmaster General and ask for permission to take military leave. And in that basis, they would save my job for me when I got through with the Army service. Well, that's what I did, and on the 28th of December, 1941, I joined the Army through the uh, regular procedures and uh, was assigned to uh, Fort Oglethorpe here in, in uh, near Chattanooga mm -hmm. and from there I was assigned to Shepherd Field, Texas in the Air Corps and at there I was assigned to uh, Chanute Field, Illinois to get some more uh, weather training, meteorology. Okay. And tell, tell me about that, those initial days you had uh, applied to the Postmaster General for military leave. Yes. Now, you, you said you had no family at that besides your siblings, your brothers and sisters, and, mm -hmm. and that kind of a thing. Um, what, what really pushed you to want to wanna make that change? Was it the events that were taking place in the world? Is it yes. seeing your friends, or what yes. was involved there? Essentially, that's what it was. 
uh, I kept watching the newspapers and the radio, and uh, that's what built up in, in the back of my mind. And so that's what caused me to apply for uh, military service. Okay. Now, what was it like? What, did, what were you feeling when you got that letter back from the, from the Postmaster, Postmaster General? General. Saying uh, it's okay, go ahead and go. Uh, uh, he said, uh, we, we can give you permission to do that, to transfer uh, while you're in service. And said, uh, but I will, would like for you to wait until after Christmas rush because it, they, uh, we don't want to get, have the burden of getting somebody real quick to f fill in your job here. Well, they didn't have any trouble because so, so, one of the ladies there in the neighborhood volunteered to, do, to take my place while I was in Army service. Okay. And from Chanute Field, I went to... Uh, One oh, second now. So, okay. so you got that letter there saying it's okay to go. You, you headed out in December, and the first place you were assigned was... Fort Oglethorpe. Now, what did you do in Fort Oglethorpe? Just waiting around. Just waiting around. Waiting to be assigned. Waiting to be assigned. And had you already had the understanding that you were going to get into weather and meteorology, or no, was it, it still to come? Uh, I had uh, passed a, a civil service examination for minor observer in meteorology, and uh, I was approved, but I, I was not didn't stay home long enough to be assigned to something in in uh, civil service meteorology. Okay, so how long did you remember how long you stayed in Fort Oglethorpe? Oh, just a few days. Just, just a few, few days. days. Because from there, I got an assignment to uh, Shepherd Field, in Shepherd Texas. Field, Texas. Now, what did you do in Shepherd Field, in Texas? Mainly just wait around. Another waiting game. Yes. And any idea of what your assignment was going to be yet, or? or? No, uh, I had. I, I didn't get my assignment to weather until I got to Chanute Field. But while I was still at Shepherd Field. I had a real bad cold, or actually it was uh, sand in my lungs because the wind blew the sand so much at Shepherd Field. Okay. But anyway, there were two Japanese brothers in my billet, in my uh, barracks. And uh, they knew I was sick, and they knew that they wouldn't take me if I told anybody if I went on sick call or anything. So they, I was called, signed to uh, uh, KP. And they that would have kept me at she Chanute Field, at uh, Shepherd Field. So both of them volunteered <coughs> to take my tour as KP kitchen police, so I could get away and go on to Chanute Field, where I was in the weather uh, school up there. Okay, do you remember about what time you left Shepherd? Uh, as far as what year or day? Oh you left yes, Shepherd to oh go to yes. Uh -huh. Field? I didn't. Uh, it, it was uh, early 42. Okay. January or February, still winter time at, uh, in 1942. I went in December the 28th, 1941. <coughs> so it was the next month or two, not more than two months, okay. that I went to Chanute Field, Illinois. So you, now you know you're doing weather. Was this a place just for schooling, or, or that was a place for schooling? I was there for uh, several months and extended my tour in order to uh, learn communications, and I became a uh, teletype uh, attendant. I had had set up one new one when I got to my next station, but anyway, I was uh, uh, listed as a weather officer NCO and. Uh, for uh, just tending to the weather, sending up balloons and all that they, we did, and uh, uh, that's where I learned it. And then I was assigned when I finished that after, I guess it was six months I was still in school up there. Okay. They sent me to uh, Augusta, Georgia, to Daniel Field, where I was a weather forecaster. And I was there for uh, over a year and uh, asked to uh, go to uh, pilot school. And they said uh, that uh, they needed me in uh, 
on the ground more than they needed. They had plenty of pilots at that time. And so they, they sent me to anti-aircraft OCS. Okay, which was where? At Camp Davis, North Carolina. Okay. That was OCS. And I got out of there in uh, four months and was assigned to uh, Camp Hewland, Texas as a lieutenant and assigned to a self-propelled weapons uh, platoon, company and platoon. And we trained uh, at Chinook Field the whole winter. We trained uh, three different groups of people to go overseas. But they kept me there as tra a training officer. Okay. And uh, I stayed there until we got uh, control of uh, the air in uh, Africa and uh, early Europe. And uh, uh, I went out one day and saw, we got air control, went out one day and saw a bunch of officers picking up cigarette butts. And I says, give me the infantry. And I asked for transfer to Fort Benning, Georgia and stayed there for what they called a retread course. That's teach us the, the specialties or the characteristics of infantry training. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed that more than anything else, I, any other place I had been because it was leadership training. Mm -hmm. It wasn't technical. It was, some of it was technical, but, but it was most, mostly for leadership. And I stayed there until uh, finished the school training there and went was assigned to Camp Croft, South Carolina. Okay, one second. How long did you end up staying at, at uh, Fort Benning for your retread there? That was uh, four or five months, or five something months. like that, yes. Okay, sir. and now we're off to? Uh, Fort Benning, to Camp Croft, South Carolina. I was assigned to G3 uh, headquarters for training troops in the field. Okay. We had exercises, uh, tactical exercises as well, firing weapons, and that lasted for a little over a year, and uh, came my turn to go overseas. Okay. Well, my best friend that went through all those schools with me, most of them, uh, he and I got on a plane in Memphis and flew to San Francisco at Hamilton Field, and we got 16 shots in one day getting ready to go overseas. That's at the airport. Right. And uh, they uh, gave us a chance to go zero in a new rifle that we had. Okay. And uh, uh, it, they called us one night out of a movie and says, come get on the ship. We got on an ATC ship, airplane, Hold that ATC ship one second. Uh -huh. And you're saying you're flying from Memphis to where? To the West to, Coast? To West Coast, Hamilton okay. Field. Hamilton Field. And you said this was a good friend. Do you remember his name? Yes, John Mitchell Schofield. Okay. He's a full colonel now. Okay. So and he, he and I were on the plane then to go to uh, the Pacific. We didn't know where. Okay. And uh, our sea orders were sealed, and they gave me to care for the orders in a sealed envelope because my name started with A. I suppose that was what it was. But anyway, they didn't tell where we were going or anything. But we got on this ATC plane and there were 10 medics on there and uh, five or six nurses. And we all laid down on our duffel bags in the back there. It was just a bare floor. And with our clothes on and everything, we rested as best we could and flew all the way to Hickam Field. That's on, uh, on Pearl Harbor area. That's, that's Hickam Field. This is 50 years ago, I'm recalling. You're doing well. You're doing a very good job. And uh, at, at Hickam Field, we were told to keep our stuff together, our personal things together, uniforms and everything, and we were ready to board the plane. Well, we got the call out in a movie to come report to headquarters. 
And we did, and they told us to get on the plane and get your stuff in. Well, we left our uh, billet was had big holes in the walls where the, the Pearl Harbor had been hit on Hickam Field. But anyway, we we got on there and. Uh, we made two or three stops and finally stopped at, we went to Saipan to Pacific Ocean Area Command there and got some, they opened the orders and gave us some new orders to join the 77th Infantry Division. And, uh, let me see now, let me recall here a moment. You're doing fine. Uh, About what time, what, what year is this when you're getting those new orders when you're in Saipan? Yes. What year was that? That was uh, 45. Okay. And in April of 45, I believe it was. And uh, <coughs> we were uh, put back on the plane and they took us to Guam and put us in a billet there. And it rained uh, four days while we were there. And uh, we couldn't pull out, we couldn't leave there to go to Okinawa. We were signed to go to Okinawa. And we couldn't get through the weather. Well, when about five days after we'd been there, the, they, the weather cleared up a little bit and they put us on a marine, armed marine plane and told us we were, they didn't tell us where we were going. We just got on there and went. Anyway, that armed plane took us to Okinawa and uh, the airfield was still on fire. That is, planes that the kamikaze had come in, and the, where we landed was still on fire. The little hutments and and airplanes, and but we went on in, and and they signed us to a uh, billet out on the open face of a hill, and no cover over you at all. You just laid on the ground on your junk, and. Uh, they had a canopy of airplanes flying around all night long and uh, of course that kept us awake and we could see off in the distance kamikaze coming in on the ships out there on the periphery perimeter and uh, we'd see them knock these planes down. They, none of them, while I was there, the night I spent the night there, none of them uh, got into the, the land. They didn't get past those ships. Uh, around the perimeter. Now was John Schofield still with you at this yes, point? Yes, yes, we were to get, still together. Okay. And uh, after, well the next, sometime next afternoon, uh, somebody yelled for us, Arnold and Schofield, come with me. And uh, we went to a headquarters and uh, where the uh, 3rd Battalion bot was, 1st Battalion it was then, and uh, they put us in a big pyramidal tent, great big tent, and had uh, our bat battalion commander and uh, regimental commander and a bunch of the, all the battalion commanders in there, just brass. And uh, they had shined a big light on us and uh, we sat in a chair right in the middle and they all asked us all kinds of questions. When was the last fun you had, if you know what I mean, and uh, uh, where are you from, and you know, what kind of work did you do? And they picked us out, one at a time, and said, I want you in my battalion, and I want you in this battalion. And Schofield says, can I go with Arnold to the uh, battalion? And we had an officer, battalion commander from uh, Birmingham, Alabama, I've forgotten his name. At 50 years ago, I've forgotten okay. a whole lot. But uh, we were assigned to the same battalion. And uh, uh, they put us on a truck. Now, this is how we got to that tent. I'm, I'm missing a, okay. a right. moment I'm there. But they, when, we, when we were assigned, they uh, gave us uh, in instructions to get on the deuce and a half truck mm -hmm. and all of that battalion assignments got on that truck. Now this is a little bit graphic but it's the one thing that I've dreamed about all my life since then. In that deuce and a half truck we were going up a hill 
and we saw a tank coming out of the vicinity of a big cave and uh, uh, we saw it approaching and two men, two Japanese soldiers came out of a cave right in front of it. It was, it was parked in front and they came out of the cave with satchels around them and they were headed to, for that for that uh, a vehicle and uh, it opened fire on them, put them both down. Of course they just blew. And we didn't know wh who was in that cave but we went on up the hill and on one side of the road there were six marines laying on their back their feet sticking out from under shelter hives and of course we didn't know how long they'd been there or anything else. We continued, the driver took, continued to take us to the tent where these people chose us and us made assignments uh, to their, where they wanted us. And uh, then we... Tell me one second while we're there because you, you clarified yourself a few minutes ago when you said that this is even one of those situations that you you had dreams about even later. Yes. Was this the first time that you really experienced seeing people get shot up like that, or? No. When we, uh, I, I can explain that. Sure. Uh, when we got our battalion assignments, I had the second platoon, and John had the third platoon. He had weapons. Uh, well, then we were. Uh, uh, See, I, I got us to, uh, oh, going up the hill. And when we were uh, got back to the battalion, <coughs> my platoon sergeant was Whitey Lamacchia from New York, blonde-headed Italian boy, sawed off, he wasn't as big as I was. He was my platoon sergeant. And uh, he said, Lieutenant, give me that uh, M1 carbine says, you don't want to be seen with that around here. Brand new, I'd, back at the States I had uh, zeroed it in and everything and cleaned all the cosmoline off of it. It was in good shape. I didn't hesitate. I handed him that carbine. He threw it over his back in a big pile of rocks, lava rocks, and says, now, uh, Hoppy will get you one, uh, get you another rifle. And I walked with him, and uh, under his bunk, in a tent, under his bunk, the sand had built up, like it would at the beach or something, to, uh, uh, for there were three M1 rifles under there. All of them had sand and rust all over, and they were filthy dirty. He gave me one, and I carried it for the rest of the time, the rest mm -hmm. of the time I was overseas. Okay. Of course, I had to clean it good. Yeah, hold that thought right there.